So, um, welcome to North. This is what I say. I come up and welcome people. Uh, my name's Tim. I'm one of the pastors here, and I just want to jump in uh, by maybe uh, talking about something that's relatable to everyone. My mom recently gave me like a large box of stuff that she kept from when I was in school. Does anybody do this? Is this what moms do? You just keep like this large? Yeah, yeah, okay, we got moms clapping. So this is like a thing. It's like a big box of stuff that my mom gave me. And it's just got like, I think my immunization records were in there and, uh, and like my birth certificate and I had my baby book was in there and, and like some clothes and stuff I wore when I was like a little... I was never a little kid, but when I was a younger child and, and all this stuff, well, in the midst of all of that, there was some like school papers. Like uh, at one point I saw, I got, I think a spirit award. I don't know what that means. And then I got, um, apparently I was on student council. I don't remember that. I got a good citizenship award, but I wanted to just share some of this today so that you people would know who you were dealing with. Um, I'm really proud of this one. It was in the box. I think I'm gonna hang it on the wall next to my degree. It's a certificate of effort. (laughs) It doesn't say what the effort was in, just that, you know what? It's the end of the year. I grew up in the generation where everybody gets a trophy. What are we gonna give the cinnamon kids? You know what? He was here, effort. There you go. I remember field day was a whole event in itself. I only ever remember competing in two events in field day. One was the tug of war because I was a call me healthy child. And so, they, you know, in your class, everybody had to compete in two things. So they were like, what can Tim do? You know what? Let's let him anchor tug of war. And then I always ran the long distance run which made no sense, but nobody else wanted to run it. So those were the two things that I remember, the tug of war and the long distance run. And I have all these ribbons where like I was on a team that got like third place or my class got second place. This one I thought was interesting. It just says award. (laughs) Some of you have watched me in the gym. This is astute. I tell you all that so that I can show you this one because... As I was going through this box of stuff that my mom had collected for me and kept for me over the years, there was one thing that reminded me about a defining moment. And a lot of times, if we're honest, uh, uh, the defining moments in our life, they came around an obstacle, they came around a challenge, they came around a fear. And so when I saw this, it reminded me of a challenge and an obstacle and a fear that I, I overcame, and it was a defining moment in my life. And it was this one, it was the a celebration of our country, Stone Street Elementary, fifth grade awards program. Now, the reason that this stood out is because inside this program, it lists me as having a special job, probably because of my effort. I got picked for this job. I was supposed to come in at the beginning of the program where we were going to graduate from fifth grade, and I was supposed to welcome everyone, hello foreshadowing to my future, I was supposed to welcome everyone, and then I was supposed to have everyone stand and say the pledge to the flag. And so I am very confident. My mom got me a new tie. It looked like the flag because it's a celebration of our country. And I am like, I don't know, how old are you in the fifth grade? 14, 15? No, I was like 10. I was like 10 years old, 11 years old. and, And I walk in, and I get behind the podium. And for the first time ever, I am at a podium in front of a large group of people. And I look out there at all of the adoring parents and faculty, and I completely freeze. I don't know why I'm here. It says it in the program, welcome. I just have to say one word. Welcome, and I can't find it, and so I stumble, and I'm like, um, hey, uh, there's people here, and so I stumble through the welcome, and then I get to the part where I'm supposed to lead the pledge, which was great, because then I got to turn my back on everyone and face the flag and lead the pledge, but then I couldn't remember how the pledge starts. Did you ever feel like if you could just get started, you could get through it? You ever had that kind of conversation? And I'm up there going, uh, it's the pledge, so it starts with uh, I. I feels right. I, I think I is the right word. So I just say the word I. have no idea what comes after it. And I say I. 
I, yeah, I is definitely the first word. I, finally, after like the fifth I, the parents and everybody had pity on me and they just started. They were like, I, and then they just went on. And I was just so embarrassed. I was just devastated. Like, you know, I got up there and I had this one job. You had one job, dude, you know? And I just couldn't do it. And I was really down and sad and the whole, you know, whole program. I played saxophone in elementary school band. I was just a sad saxophone player, you know? Uh, got to the end and went outside. And I, you know, my dad could tell I was really upset and really down. And, and he just told me, he said, listen, Tim, don't worry about it. Because I, almost everybody's afraid to speak in public. Like, that's really a common fear. It's like a, like a common thing. A lot of people are afraid to speak in public. And, 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 and truthfully, I did, a, I did some research a while back. I don't know if this is still true, but at one point, the two greatest fears worldwide were public speaking and the fear of being alone forever. One of those feels worse. Um, <laughs> but those are like the two biggest fears. And I remember uh, my dad telling me that everybody was afraid of speaking in public, not to worry about it. It was no big deal. And I was a timid kid, like I've shared with you before, that I was scared of everything. And, and I kind of, it was weird. I don't know, probably the Holy Spirit just working in my life at that young age about the future that God had for me. But I remember on the ride home, literally thinking to myself, I'm afraid of, most of the things I'm afraid of, nobody else is afraid of. So this is my shot. And I decided I was never going to be afraid to do that again. It was a defining moment. I was never going to be afraid to stand in front of a group of people and speak again. Because most of the things that I was afraid of, nobody else was. But if I could just be fearless in one area that everybody else was afraid, that was my ticket. I could do that. Well, today, I I tell you all that about defining moments because I want us all right now to just think about a defining moment in your life. There was a a, a bridge you crossed. There was a fork in the road that you approached. There was a change that took place in you where you you were going one direction and then you decided to go another direction. There was a defining moment. Do you have one? You got a defining moment in your life? Those defining moments, they're powerful. They they change the trajectory of our future often. And so today I want to take us to Scripture, and I want us to look at a defining moment that centers around some fear. It centers around uh, some some challenge that these disciples had to overcome. If you have your Bible, you're going to want to turn over to Mark chapter 4. If you don't, it'll be on the screen here. You can follow along. But in Mark chapter 4, there's a defining moment. I think if we just kind of lean in to this part of the narrative. We just kind of lean into this text. We can observe some things that are maybe true of us, and we can follow in the example that we see. Are you guys okay to do that? That's good, because I have a microphone on, so I'm going to do it anyway. Here we go. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. That day, when evening came, he, that's Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. So it's the Sea of Galilee. They're on one side. They're going to go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. And then it says, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. So Jesus is with his disciples. These are the people that he loves the most. He cares the most about them. He says, let's go to the other side. They get in a boat on their journey over to the other side. It's getting dark. There's a storm comes in, and the storm is so bad that the boat is about to sink. Okay, The boat's about to go under, and it dawns on me in this moment. Like, Let's put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples, or the sandals of the disciples for a second. It dawns on me that if I'm following Jesus... Only through what we've seen in the book of Mark. If I've been with Jesus for any amount of time, I have come to a startling reality. Following Jesus is not safe. It's not safe. Like if you're a Bible reader or you've read through the New Testament or you've been around teaching and preaching for a while, like just think about it. Jesus is constantly taking his disciples to places where bad things could happen to their personal physical being. Like, for example, real early in Jesus' ministry, he's preaching in a house that is so crowded that no one can get in or out. So crowded that the people who need to get to Jesus for healing are tearing a hole in the roof to get to Jesus. You remember this story? You remember it? And what does Jesus do when the guy gets in front of him? Does he just immediately heal that guy? Oh, no. Because Jesus' enemies are in the room. So he takes it upon himself in this moment, in this crowded room where there is no escape, to say your sins are forgiven you, which was blasphemous, which was going to get them in trouble. Can you imagine the disciples? They're like, they're going to kill us. We can't get away. 
Then Jesus is with his disciples on another time, and just to make, you know, just to make matters worse, he encourages them to break Sabbath law. That would have gotten them into a lot of trouble, gave them a whole lot of negative attention. In, uh, in a field trip in Mark chapter five, Jesus takes his disciples on a field trip to a graveyard. Do you remember this? At nighttime, and a demon-possessed man comes out of a cave at them. This isn't safe. This doesn't feel safe. This doesn't look okay. And the Mark, uh, Mark, the author of this gospel, he paints this beautiful picture in Mark chapter six where Jesus is sending the disciples out a couple at a time and saying, hey, you guys go over here and teach and you go over here and preach. It's gonna be great. You know, people are gonna get saved. They're gonna love you. They're gonna follow me. It's gonna be awesome. And then Mark follows that story immediately with the story of John the Baptist who was like one of the very first followers of Jesus being beheaded. Like, hey, go, you just got a new job. Go preach and John got killed. Mark chapter eight, Jesus says that if you wanna follow me, he says you have to deny yourself, take up your cross. All of those listening to Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. They had all seen crucifixions. Take up your cross and follow me. And then just to you know, accentuate his point, he says, because if you try to save your life, you're gonna lose it. And only if you lose your life for my sake or for the sake of the gospel, then you will find it. And then finally, Jesus is like in a lot of trouble. The religious leaders, the chief priests, those who have the authority to put him in jail or kill them are really angry with him. And they all live in Jerusalem. And instead of like hiding out in a cave or playing it low key, Jesus marches his disciples straight into Jerusalem where he is arrested, tried, convicted, and kill, killed. And this whole thing is so messy and so terrible and so stressful that Peter, you know, one of the strongest disciples, is called out by a 13-year-old girl. And she says, you know Jesus. And he starts to cuss at her and tell her he doesn't know what she's talking about. I think somewhere along the line, Mark was trying to make a point. Are you catching the theme? Are you picking up what he's putting down? We kind of believe that just Jesus is gonna make everything okay all the time. But the truth is, following Jesus just isn't that safe. And it makes me wonder about my own life. Like in this defining moment, the realization that following Jesus isn't safe kind of makes me wanna recoil. Kind of makes me wanna step back from the whole thing. I don't wanna do unsafe things. But like, that's what the disciples are experiencing and they still followed him. There must be something here. There must be some reason to still follow Jesus, but it wasn't because of safety. It wasn't because of their protection because he has yet again led them into a place that is unsafe. And it just makes me wonder, like, listen, let's just let's get real. Is it possible? Is it possible that the Holy Spirit is leading me or leading you into something that isn't safe? Just isn't that maybe Jesus expects to find us working toward the gospel kingdom in places that other people are afraid to go. Because following Jesus was never intended to be safe. It continues on, Mark chapter four, verse 38. Look at what it says. Jesus was in the stern and he was sleeping on a cushion. The boat is sinking and Jesus is taking a nap. The disciples woke him and they said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, be quiet, be still. And the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Well, isn't that a question? Why are you so afraid? Jesus asked his why are you so afraid? Well, I don't know, maybe because the storm is bigger than me? Maybe because I can't, I, can't, I can't see the end of the storm? Like everything's just stacked up in the wind and the waves? I mean, think about it. If you've, anybody ever been on a boat in the middle of a storm? I'm not talking about a ship, like a big boat. I'm talking like a little boat in the middle of a storm. I have. I've been fishing. We got caught up in a storm. We didn't see it coming because we didn't look, right? <laughs> Sometimes you just got to fish, man. And the storm comes up and we're trying to get to safety and, and when it happened to me, it was still daylight outside and we had running lights on the boat and we had headlamps and flashlights. They're just in the dark. Like this is terrifying. Being on the water in the middle of a storm is terrible and four of these bros are fishermen. So they've been on the water. 
They've experienced this before, or they've heard of others who have had this experience. This storm must have been out of control. And Jesus says, why are you so afraid? Maybe because the storm's too big for me. Or, or, or maybe, maybe Jesus, maybe we're scared, maybe we're afraid because we're not in control. I love to control my life. Anybody else? No, you're good Jesus-loving people. But for me, I love to control my life. I love to do everything I can to have everything in its right place and, and to be in control of everything so that I know what's coming and I can anticipate what's gonna happen next. I love control. But like, let's get real honest. Can we do that? Control is an illusion. You live long enough, you learn there's just some stuff that happens in your life you don't have any control over. There's some things that are gonna happen that you just can't control. And the disciples are in this boat and they're in the middle of a storm and there's nothing they can do but die. That's all they can do. So maybe they're scared because they're just not in control. Or maybe the biggest one, because it says it right here in the text. Why are, you, why are you so afraid? Well, because we don't think you really care about us, Jesus. That's what it says. It says, do you not care if we drowned? Like, why, what would lead them to believe that Jesus doesn't care about them? Well, maybe. Maybe they don't think Jesus cares about them because they're in the middle of a storm and Jesus hasn't handled the storm in the timing that they felt was right. Maybe Jesus hasn't brought it into the storm quick enough. Maybe Jesus didn't get involved the way that they thought he should have gotten involved. Maybe they thought Jesus should have already been awake and bringing comfort. Maybe they thought Jesus should have been a better weatherman and he should have just you know, directed them around the storm. Maybe they bought into the idea that following Jesus was safe and they thought that as long as they had Jesus in their boat, there were never gonna be storms. We don't know. But we know that they were afraid, and in part they were afraid because they weren't sure that Jesus cared about them. Well, what about you? You ever feel like that? You ever feel like the storm and the circumstances of your life have piled up and they're stacked up high all around you and it's just too much? It's just too big? You feel the things that are happening around you and they're way beyond your control. They're way beyond your perspective of, of control and being able to do what's next or see what's coming. You feel like maybe your safety and your protection have fallen down around you. You ever lay in bed at night praying and wondering if God really cares about you? Why are you so afraid? But what happens is really interesting. If you watch what happens next. Mark, in this narrative, like he, he pulls no punches and he does something really interesting here. Jesus, like right in this one moment, in verse 41, Jesus is gonna change their fear. Watch what happens. He changes their fear. This is amazing. Jesus calms the storm. He asks them why they're so afraid. And then in Mark 4, 41, he says, then they were terrified. Wait, they didn't stop being afraid? No, it says they were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this? See, First, Jesus says, well, why are you so afraid? I'm like, well, the storm's really big and it's out of my control and we didn't know if you cared about us. But now you stood up, told the wind and waves to shut their pie hole and go to the room and now we're kind of afraid of you. <laughs> sort of, sort of not sure, right? Like we were afraid of the bully until you showed up and you was like way bigger than the bully. And now, well, we got questions. Who is this? Some translations will, will, will put it this way. They'll say, what kind of man is this? And isn't this the question, right? Like, for real. Isn't this the question? Like, the only question that really matters? I like guess the question that we'll have to answer that determines the trajectory of our life here. It will determine our life in eternity. It's the only question that really comes up when we're thinking about whether or not God really cares about us. It's the question that we're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis when the circumstances of the storm are just so big. And it's the only question that mattered that night in that boat. And it's really the only question that matters today in this room. Who is this guy? Who are we dealing with? The power that Jesus displays over nature in that moment redirected the fear of the disciples and it should redirect our fear today. And if that's the case, 
Well, we gotta know who we're dealing with. See, when we encounter people uh, today, when it comes to faith and religion, like well, there's a whole group of people in our world who don't believe in God. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people who don't believe in God. And there's like whole like, groups of people who are against religion. But you don't really find a whole lot of people who don't believe in Jesus. Like everybody kind of agrees that Jesus was a real person. They, and in fact, not only is everybody like Jesus, everybody likes Jesus so much, they want Jesus on their team. Right? Have you ever noticed that everybody can claim Jesus, they can all take something that Jesus said or something that Jesus did and make it fit their worldview, make it fit their life? Because we all, we all like Jesus. And as much as our world tries to separate us through, our, you know, through all of our differences and all the things that you know, are supposed to keep us apart, like everybody thinks Jesus is on their side. Something that Jesus just came to teach everyone a new way to think about the disenfranchised and the disadvantaged and the marginalized and something that Jesus came to start a love revolution to bring peace on earth and to show everyone how to live their best life. Some think that Jesus was just here to be a good example of how to follow God. But the thing is, I don't really think Jesus came for any of those things. I mean, he did all of those things. But none of those are the stated purpose for why Jesus came. None of them truly identify who he is. No, Jesus, Jesus was pretty clear. Jesus was pretty clear that he was God. Jesus was clear that he was God and that he had come to save us from our sins. Jesus said that he existed before Abraham. Jesus claimed that he and the Father are one. Jesus said that he and the Father are equal. Jesus claimed to have power and authority that only God has. Jesus claimed to have the authority to cancel sin. He had the authority to forgive sin. Jesus told his followers that he could answer their prayers. Jesus told his followers that he would be with them always. In John 16, Jesus says, whatever belongs to the Father in heaven also belongs to me. And when asked directly who Jesus thought he was, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And to be clear, everyone knew what Jesus was saying. It wasn't like he was speaking in some type of cryptic term, and he wasn't being real clear, and he was kind of keeping it a secret. Everybody knew what Jesus meant. In fact, in John chapter 11, Jesus goes to his friend Martha, and he says, hey, Martha, guess what? I'm the resurrection and the life. All who believe in me, yet they die, yet shall they live. Do you believe this? And his friend Martha says, oh, yeah, we for sure believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Even his enemies, his enemies believed that Jesus believed he was God. In Mark, in Mark 14, when Jesus is on trial, it says again, meaning they'd already been down this line of questioning. It says again, the, high, the chief priest asked him, are you claiming to be the Messiah? And Jesus says, I am claiming it, and you're gonna see me sitting at the right hand of the Father and coming on the clouds. To the, to the, to the answer that he gives, they say, we don't need any more witnesses. We should convict him right now for blasphemy. He obviously believes he's God. And they did. See, Jesus didn't go to the cross. They didn't kill Jesus because he started a love revolution. They didn't put Jesus on the cross because he gave us a different way to think about the disenfranchised. They didn't put Jesus on the cross because he was such a great example of what it meant to follow God. They put Jesus on the cross because Jesus believed he was God, which is insanity. Like, let's just be real. That's crazy talk. If you had someone that worked in your office who showed up tomorrow and said, hey, guess what? I'm the Messiah. You would not have lunch with them. Because, because if you claim to be God and you prove it with no actions, you do nothing to verify that claim. You're just insane. In the classic movie, Hoosiers, and I call it a classic because it's awesome. If you haven't seen this movie, you should see this movie. Hoosiers, there's this scene, it's about a basketball team. And there's this scene where the new coach is coming in and the old coach is going out and they're having a disagreement. And the new coach and the old coach are having like this spar of words. And the old coach looks at the new coach and he says, look, mister, there's two kinds of dumb. A guy who gets naked, runs around in the snow, barks at the moon, and then there's the guy that does that same thing in my living room. The first one don't matter much, but the second one, well, I'm kind of forced to deal with. And the same is true of Jesus. If Jesus shows up and claims to be God and does nothing to prove it and does nothing to show that he actually is God, he's just a guy barking at the moon, running naked through the snow. But when he shows up, predicts his own death, burial, resurrection, and then pulls it off, 
We can't afford to deal with that guy. And who is this? What kind of man is this? It forces us to put Jesus in one of three categories. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, he is either a liar who should not be trusted or a crazy person who should not be followed or he was telling the truth and he is God come to save us. He redirects our fear and in doing so shows us exactly who he is. So what about you? The only question that matters in the redirecting of our fear, what do you say about Jesus? Who do you say that he is? How you answer that question has everything to do with your now, with your future, and with what you're supposed to be afraid of. See, look, if Jesus is God, and he has the power to save you from your sins, then this final observation from the text is beautiful. See, Jesus, in the midst of this storm and this chaos and things out of control, Jesus is in their boat. And there was nothing about those disciples that made Jesus need to be in their boat. He didn't need anything from them. He was in their boat because he chose to be in their boat. He loved them and he went into that storm. You think that storm took Jesus by surprise? Jesus went into that boat knowing that they were going into a storm. And he went anyway. And the evidence that he was in that boat, you know why Jesus was in that boat? Jesus was in that boat because he came to this earth to die on the cross for you. Otherwise, Jesus isn't on the planet and Jesus isn't in the boat at all. So in the world that we live in where we're supposed to be divided and there's chaos everywhere, and let's just be real, the storm looks pretty big. When you find yourself in those moments where your life is beyond your control, you come to a defining moment. What do you say about Jesus? Because he was in the boat with those disciples because he loved them. And he wants so much to be in the boat with you. So why are you so afraid this morning? Think it through. This fear doesn't show up all the time as terror or fright. Often fear shows up and manifests in different ways. Sometimes it just shows up as anger or frustration or bitterness or snarkiness or cynicism or apathy. Why are you so afraid? Is the storm around you so big and the noise so loud? Are you scared because you lack control over the way that you feel or over the events in your life? Have you come to a place where maybe you're unsure that Jesus cares for you at all? So I, I came to a place where I wasn't gonna be afraid of that anymore. I wasn't gonna be afraid to stand in front of people ever again and talk. Do you know why I'm not afraid to do that? Because I just need, I just need you to know that Jesus is who he says he is. And if you've never given your life to him, if the answer you have for who Jesus is isn't your savior, I'm begging you to just take the claims of Jesus seriously. You gotta do something with that. We're gonna sing in just a few minutes and it's a song that helps us take courage. It's our declaration and our proclamation today. See, if Jesus is in our boat and we're wondering who he is, well, he's the guy who lights up every shadow and he goes up every mountain there's no wall he won't kick down and there's no lie in your life that he wouldn't tear down to get to you. See, Jesus is the one with all the power in the boat and he redirects our fear to him 
Because if, if we put our reverence and we put our lives in his hands, we don't have to fear anything else like the guys in the boat. They never had to fear that again. I can tell you, following Jesus will not be easy. It will not be safe. And in fact, it may require you to go to some unsafe places and it might make your life more challenging. But like the guys in that boat, I've come to realize that it is absolutely worth it. Beginning a relationship with Jesus is simple. Having a relationship with Jesus is not easy, but it's worth it. Doesn't mean that you'll never feel scared again. It doesn't mean that you won't face the storm, but it means he'll always be near you. Can we pray? Jesus, we just come to you acknowledging it's bigger than us. The storm is too big. Our lives are out of control. We can't control it. But we know that you can. And Father, we repent when in our fear we have acted in a way that does not represent you well. When we have sinned because, of our, because we were afraid and we forgot that we were in the boat with the one who controls all things. And if you're here tonight, today and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never taken seriously the claims that Jesus made and you'd like to give your life to Christ, you can pray a prayer and I'll pray along with you. Someone prayed a prayer once and helped me. Maybe this will help you. You can pray along where you are. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. And I believe that you are God and that you came and you died on the cross to take away my sin and you rose again three days later. I invite you into my life. I surrender my whole life to you. Please come in and save me. And you can, listen, you can pray that however you would say it in your own words. Jesus, for those who are doing business with you right now, I pray by your Holy Spirit immediately. For those who are repenting and for those who are giving their lives to you for the first time, that by your Holy Spirit, you would bring them comfort and peace now. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.